just two guys of Minnesota sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Shot on Score North and scorenorth.com. The quality of our bats today were just okay. I mean, not 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 what we're striving for. Um, a lot of swing and miss uh, today for us, and um, it didn't really matter who was in there for them. I mean, their starter did a good job coming off the IL throwing the ball like that, but. Um, you know, we we got to find a way to put some runs on the board and and uh, and win some games. It's not even about just supporting our pitch. Our pitchers are doing a good job right now. They have been, but uh, in order to win games, I mean, we got to put some runs on the board. Dude, the, so Tristan McKenzie comes off the injured list yesterday, and uh, as Rocco said, yeah, he yeah, he did a pretty good job. Pretty good job. Yeah, he literally looked like Roger Clemens from two thousand one, yeah, with a good. boat of steroids or something like what. What was it 10 strikeouts off the injured mm-hmm. list? Yeah, that's nice lineup. What is he talking about? Our at bats were just okay. They were horrendous, dude. They were awful. Max Kepler's unplayable and he hit cleanup. What are you even talking about? Oh, I love how fu- this is. I oh, spent, my God. I spent this... the weekend at the ballpark and I'm pissed off. This is ridiculous. <laughs> no, I love it. This is great. Okay. I mean, Judd also this. sent me. For those sent... of you watching, look, this is the scorecard <laughs> from yesterday. You see all those K's? They're strikeouts. That's not okay. <laughs> Was it the third time this season they've struck out 16 times in a baseball game? Yeah. So this is your State of the Twins Monday on Minnesota Sports with Mackie and Judd, where we give you an overall snapshot of the current, sort of the big picture of the Twins, and then dive into a handful of key categories where we drill deeper. And Judd, I just he was at the ballpark all weekend, and he sent me a relatively lengthy email about the Twins yesterday. So I, I know he is packed full of takes and vitriol here. Um, This State of the Twins address weekly is brought to you by our friends at Modest Brewing. And boy, oh boy, if you have not been down to Modest or if you have not gotten your hands on, uh, I don't know, one of these 19-inch stove pipes or maybe you get get your hands on the Super Deluxe there, the Super Deluxe, a couple different options there. That's that's Macadac's favorite in the summertime. Or get on into the tap room. And try the Crooked Forest Smoked Lager, which is one of the best beers I've ever had in the North Loop. Just steps away, Declan, from Target Field and the light rail. Yeah, you can find these beers, too, at most of your local liquor stores, too. So when you're, it's a hot 90-degree day like it's been all weekend, which I love. I love the heat. And I, I need a nice cold beer to kind of help me relax and whatnot. Whether I'm on that patio at Modest, whether I'm at home, you know, dealing with my great new move-in situation, I need a nice cold beer from my friends at Modest Brewing, and they've been able to help me out there. Declan just with the the internet shakes, just 14 modest in. Okay, I think it's ready. Six cords running through different. Are we done? Did, did we finally get rid of the 50-foot cord that runs from the main level up to your Funny. office? Or? Uh, good update on that. So uh, I think as I explained to you guys, this utility closet, this low-voltage closet has like four internet cords that hang out of the wall. And to make those ethernet ports active, those cords have to be ran into a router. So right now, what's going to happen is there's one cord that goes from that low-voltage closet into my router, which is downstairs. Just one cord, no OSHA, just it runs on the ground, but it, it's not a, not a hazard like the other one was. And then upstairs in my office, I have to run a cord from the bedroom into my room, which also is on the ground. So now there's two cords, but it's not hanging off a wall. It's not running down. Draped and over two railings. Draped over three different railings. It's not an OSHA It runs through the refrigerator, actually, yeah. underneath the stove. Yeah. So luckily it's been now solved. Thank God. <laughs> I'm okay. So Declan's, Declan's um, progressing in his new home in the suburbs. All right, here's the overall snapshot for your Minnesota Twins. They're 31 and 29 after going 3 and 3 over the last seven days. But they've increased their lead in the division from two games to three and a half games by just playing 500 baseball the last week. Three and a half up on the Guardians and the Tigers. The Twins offense currently 16th in runs scored per game. Twins pitching and defense or pitching and fielding second in runs allowed per game. Baseball reference gives the Twins an 80% chance to make the playoffs, a 1% chance to win the World Series. Fangrass gives the Twins a 73% chance to make the playoffs, and a 3.5% chance to win the World Series. So you're telling me there's a chance. So I, I'd like to start here with you because it was there's a million places, and there's, by the way, five categories today. Five categories. Mm-hmm. And I think, and we'll cover everything, but to me the lasting image of the weekend is Royce Lewis 
feet up in the air, body crunched like an accordion, face pressed against the chalked first baseline, yep. and a neck, cut on his forehead. Neck bending. So the first category is, what the hell is up with some of these injuries? So we've talked about twins injuries for probably like three or four years in the spotlight, going back to the Sam Dyson trade in 2019 where they traded for an injured setup guy. And there's the Mally and the Paddock trades where there's some self-inflicted stuff in here. But there's also some really random, just unfortunate stuff that doesn't seem to happen to other franchises. So Byron Buxton, your franchise player, your former number two overall draft pick, right? One of the fastest players in Major League Baseball history just develops a degenerative knee problem at the age of like 27 and now can't play the field. That's just unfortunate, wildly unlucky. Carlos Correa taking time bomb ankle in his prime and now plantar fasciitis issues. You got Alex Kirilov who had a last ditch wrist surgery in his mid twenties. He's not 38. Like in his mid twenties, he has a last ditch wrist surgery where, where his career might be on the line. And then Royce Lewis, former number one overall pick, multiple ACL surgeries, other injuries. And now you got a first baseman for Cleveland that's just like randomly sprawled out all across the first baseline. And he can't just like, I'm not blaming Royce here. I'm just saying like circumstance. It's not that he bumps into the guy and falls over or, oh my God, I like, I somersaulted over him and landed safely. No, it's got to be the worst possible fall where you almost break your neck in front of 30,000 fans. So I just, is there a team in baseball that suffers more absurd, dumb injury luck than the Minnesota Twins? Um, well, first of all, I think you have to break them down a bit because some of it's not luck. So some of it's self-induced stupidity because like when you trade for a guy who's injured a pitcher, that's your fault. Like you can say, well, yeah, no, I mean, I don't care. It's your fault. So like that's in one bin. Um, the Kirloff thing is a bizarre thing. Like I don't blame, that's just a weird, weird thing. He didn't do something to bring that, that on. Um, yeah, like Bucks, why? Why can't he just like progress and have a great ten year yeah. career and not have well chronic wrist problems? How often have you heard about a hit or two ha having to have a bone actually shaved down? Like that's a new one for me. I've never heard that one before. You know, pitchers the thoracic outlet syndrome thing where they have to go in and do work like that. I've heard of the Kirloff thing is weird. The Lewis Buxton thing I would put in this bin because. The play yesterday was very bang, bang and very weird, but here's the bin. I put the, those two in. First of all, this is not football because Byron has played the game. Like it's football too. Now the running into the fence thing probably gets too much blame, but the way that Byron plays at times, and I would tell the same thing to Royce live to play another day, live to fight. Like it, it wasn't worth the result of that play, e even if he had to slow up and was out, and ultimately he was, right? Now, if that's game seven of the World Series, okay, dude, you got to do it. But, guys, we're in early June here, okay? And, yes, I know it, you can't, like, say, well, it's all his fault, but there is a pattern here. He ran into the fence and center last year. He had that weird – it was a great catch, but I think it was Thursday night against Cleveland, if I'm not mistaken, where he took a big – divot out because he dove backwards and he spiked his knee in and you're like oh my god it's his knee so just the totality not that one play the totality is i would have sit, sat down and told buxton the same thing but i think there's the opportunity now to tell royce this live to fight another day live to be in the lineup tomorrow nothing you're ultimately going to do on june what, what was it third june 4th yesterday nothing's going to be worth it if you get hurt what's what can i say and I don't disagree with this, like probably just just maybe don't run full speed through the base in that situation. But what the hell is the first baseman doing? The throw what is was he doing the throw was not great. And he went back to get it like it's not a great play. But yeah, he so the throw was it was strong, but it was off a bit. And so he was trying to like adjust. It was a very weird. But play. you don't like you're and I get that they have they've had that kid. It's uh, Arius, right? They've had him yeah. playing everywhere and so yeah. he hasn't i think there were some people in twins media making out that like oh they just put him at first base and he doesn't know he he's played like 18 games at first base so he's yeah. it's not that he's just put out there for the first time but 
there are rules of where you can and can't go, just sort of unwritten rules of playing first base. That 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 baseline, and maybe 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 Major League Baseball just needs to put a. They've been talking about putting a second base out there, one on the foul side, one on the yeah. fair side, so cool. that you can just create some more space there. But dude, as you're stretching on the line, that is a no fly zone for any professional first baseman, any high school first baseman. No, is you that is not a place where you stretch. In right. fact, I would argue that if you do that. The runner should be safe, even if it's like after if you're stretching beyond the base. It's so unsafe with a guy flying down full speed. But the important thing is that this is a pattern, and I appreciate it. Royce Lewis plays his God, ass You're off. blaming Royce Lewis. Look at you. But the pattern blaming, is I'd rather, I'd rather have you be out and, and you know what? You slow up. Again, it's not the World Series. It's not the playoffs. It is June 4th. And if this was the first time that he had ever done that, I would say, you know what, bad play by the first baseman. But, you know, we have a, a pattern now. And it's not worth him making that catch he made or his sprawling attempt in game one either. It's not worth it at this point. Like, dude, we need to – you have torn your ACL twice. You are predisposed. It's like with Buxton. You are clearly predisposed to injuries by how you play. So how can we how can we rectify that a bit? Because your presence – because I, I think we're going to talk about this. Your presence at third base on a daily basis is enormous. That guy is gifted. I just think there's a there's an alternate universe here somewhere, Declan, in like 1973, where we are doing this show in Cincinnati. And every Monday, it's our State of the Reds radio show. And Judd's telling Pete Rose, hey, Pete, it's a long season. Okay, all right, Charlie Hustle. Let's calm down a little bit here, flying headfirst into these bases. Okay? I don't think he got let's, hurt, though. Let's turn That's the, the hustle down. <laughs> That's the difference. I don't think he got hurt. If or he, he did, but hurt, he played anyways. Well, he played through happened. in 1973. That's a good point. But anyway, yeah. I love the kid. Don't get me wrong. I just think that we now have a pattern of enough weird plays. To, to your point, Phil, it's like, how can what can the Twins do or what's the possibility to take some of these in, injuries, some of which are flukes, but take some of them and like just pull them back a little bit. Yeah, I mean, Declan, are you putting much blame on Royce Lewis for just being just lack of control out there? Like, where do you side on this? I, I tweeted out in the middle of it because I was watching the game yesterday. That I mean, this this team is just cursed. Like they're cursed with these barrage of star players that have not lived up to the potential to the Buxton chronic knee issue before he's thirty years old. I'm like Buxton, mm-hmm. I think is a, exactly like a year younger than I am. Uh, you have Royce Lewis, who's had multiple ACL tears. He falls in the ice in the off season and tears his ACL. It is what? weird. It yes, what? that's because like that's the thing, Judd. There's a lot of teams that have young players that go all out and hustle their ass off and dive into bases and stuff. But the result of some of it for the Twins, oh yeah, is much worse than other teams with these uh-huh. core. Their core nucleus is is hanging by a thread with wrists and knees and. All sorts of Royce Lewis related ailments. And I mean, look at Justin Morneau's concussion in 2010, you know, Larry Arnold's elbow exploding in 2006. Like Joe Maurer is, with with yeah. injuries that I don't think we have fully even had come to light. But yes, it is kind of so it's like a 10 year run basically of of guys. Uh, all right. Category number two here. State of the Twins Monday. We need to talk about the elephant in the room. I feel like the elephant's been in the room very obviously for about three seasons now. And he went 0 for 4 again yesterday. He's batting below 200 again. He's 30 years old. He has played more games, I think, in the corner outfield spots, or maybe it's one of them specifically. Uh, I saw Gleeman write about this. Than anyone other than Tony Oliva and Tom Brunansky, Max Kepler. He's had, he's again, eight years as a regular in this lineup. He's had one big offensive season, and it was in 2019 when the ball was juiced and everybody had a big offensive season. Mm -hmm. He's in the final year of his contract, the team option next year. You can just say goodbye. Uh, At what point, when you've got Matt Walner, a former first round pick, tearing it up, Trevor Larnick is going to be ready to come up at some point again, a former first round pick. At what point do you just call it good with Max? Like, what are we waiting for at this point? He's literally at the end of his contract. You got first round picks in their mid 20s that are just ready to be up here. What are we doing? 
So I think this is again the twins being stubborn, which they, which uh, this administration has certainly showed it can be. I think what we have here is they tried to trade him in the winter, and they thought it's Max Kepler. We're going to take him to market and get something for him. And teams are like, ah, oh, we're good. You know, we'll give you probably a low prospect or something. I mean, he's not worth much. So they're they're like, hell no, we'll hold on to Max. And now they're just being stubborn, and they've done this before. Why is he batting cleanup yesterday? What are they even thinking at this point? He is almost unplayable. He's being booed now, and I, I feel bad yeah. for him in a way, but he deserves it. I mean, he does. It's just, it's absolutely to me, um, the stubbornness of the twins. I mean, he is he is as close to being really a good candidate to DFA as you can possibly get. He's also just like He's not even like a heart and soul guy, right? No. He's not. You, th- there's times where Nick Nick Punto would every other year Nick Punto hit 190, and then every other year he had good seasons, and and there'd be years where fans are like, "What the hell is this guy doing on the team?" And the answer was, "Well, he's literally like the heartbeat of the clubhouse. He can play every position. He's a defensive wizard." Yep. There's an anecdote because again, Kepler has had one what I would call above average season as a, as a hitter in the eight years he's been in this lineup, it was 2019. So he's not here unless he's 30 years old. Are you, you're, you're waiting for the offensive breakout at this point. He is who he is, but you could say he's a pretty good defender. He can, he's got good range. He's got a good arm in the corner outfield spots, right? What if he, what if his value was as a versatile outfielder who could also play some other positions? Well, Aaron Gleeman wrote in the athletic this weekend reported quote, Kepler has expressed a strong preference against playing center field. And this is a team that throughout his entire career has had a center fielder in Byron Buxton that can't stay healthy, can't stay out there. So the last time he played in center field, I believe, or the last time he started was 2021. So like, okay, so you can't hit and you're an unwilling participant to go and play a different position. And you're not a guy that's like the centerpiece of the clubhouse and the chemistry and the culture, then what are you doing? He's just a dud. Like he's just taking up a spot for somebody else. And you're blocking guys too. That that's yeah. what I don't understand. They're allowing you. They're they're allowing him to bl- to block guys. And and then you know the other thing too that I love about this team is, well, we'll recall Kyle Garlic because we're facing a bunch of of southpaws coming up, and Garlic is the antidote to southpaws. And meanwhile, Matt Walner is basically tearing up Triple A. And you can't find a way to get him up, but you have Max Kepler batting cleanup on Sunday. You talk about self-inflicted wounds; those are self-inflicted wounds. Yeah, I will. I will defend a little bit the Kyle Garlic thing because he actually is a good platoon hitter. He's a good when used situation. I don't think he's a guy you're going to run out there as a starting player, but he does have against left-handed pitching in his career. He does have an 820 OPS, but I'm generally like, I'm with you. Like, well, no, get and, Waller and, up here. And your point is a good point. But if I was uh, Falvey, Levine, and, and Rocco's boss, I would say, okay, that's cool. But we are now going to have to get rid of Max. So if you were like the you, owner, basically, is like you don't, or just, or just if I could be their boss, like just <laughs> make me their boss for a day, I would say you're choosing what sounds appealing to do, and that's fine. Yeah. But at the end of the day, then what we need to do is get Kepler off the roster. I mean, there's enough sample size here post his 2019 season where he got an MVP vote. Like he was one of the 20 best hitters in the American League, and he deserves credit for that. That happened in his age 26 season. So it it looked like, oh, wow, there's a nice blossoming perennial, really good outfielder, a guy who can also carry your lineup and hit, hit, hit in the middle of it. But in the last 319 games, so from 2020 and on, this is 1,300 plate appearances. He's hitting 217. His OPS plus is 95. So 100 below is average. average. It's a yeah. below average hitter in 1,300 plate appearances. This isn't a fluke. That is enough sample size to suggest at ages 27, 28, 29, 30 years old. Those are your prime it's time years. To move on. Your prime yeah. years. Time to move on. This Goodbye. same thing happened offensively to Miguel Sano, by the way, where they 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 hit their they both had big seasons in 2019, like the whole league. They're entering their prime, and then, like, Sano isn't even playing anywhere. He's just out of baseball, which we can do an episode on that at some point. But, yeah, like, I don't know what else. And don't be fooled if he gets hot for four or five games. Like, I I just don't get it at this point. He has has pretty much zero value at this point as a baseball player. And, by the way, his, uh, his wins above replacement is exactly zero so far this season. 
You could justify before because he was like a two win player, which is kind of like a league average player, but I don't know. All right, category number three here. It's time for a Luis Arise Pablo Lopez update because oh that was one of the big trades the Twins made. So uh, Pablo gave up six runs in his last outing, and statistically, he's having his worst season since 2019 in terms of like ERA and some of the other numbers. Like he has the highest home run rate of his career, the worst weak contact rate of his career so far this year. I still have faith that he'll turn it around and be a, a good, solid starting pitcher for the Twins this year, and he's under contract now. Luis is now leading Major League Baseball in both batting average and on-base percentage, and he has one of the highest OPSs, even though he's not an extra-base hits guy. He is such a machine getting on base that his OPS is also bloated. He's hitting three ninety two, and we're in June now, by the way. This is no longer like April hot start. He went five for five a couple days ago. Yep. He's getting on base at a 445 clip. Mm -hmm. He has 80 hits this season and 11 strikeouts. Luis Arise is basically a modern day Tony Gwynn. So, (laughs) how do you guys feel right now about the Luis Arise for Pablo Lopez trade? Wait, hold hold on a second. I hear something coming. It's the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers are storming the show. They're so upset they're, right they're now. They're storming the podcast the, studio. The gatekeepers will tell you that this is still a great trade. They don't care. Um, look, it's weird that, and I guess it's sort of weird, that Lopez, since he signed the contract, actually has regressed because he was great before he got the extension. Um, all of that being said, I'm going to defend the Twins a bit here because I actually think that in this case, we know that the two ways to get a top line or what you consider to be a top line starter are to spend a ton on the open market. And then it's dicey because the competition for the few guys that actually hit free agency is huge or to make a trade. And that trade's not going to be, Hey, send them your 10th best prospect and a couple more slappies and get a top line starter. So I think it, it would be, it would be hypocritical for me to say it's a terrible trade or what were they doing? Because I love to watch a lot of the starters now. Now yeah. L- Lopez has struggled, but struggling is relative to what we become used to, right? Because his struggles are not like, Oh my God, we're watching uh booth bonds or descend. So while I am acutely aware of the fact that this team can't hit a lot of times, and it's really weird because combined on Wednesday and Thursday, they scored 15 runs and won two games. And they've scored, I think, like six runs since. I think it's they scored four in three games over the... Yeah, I, I mean, it's incredible. But anyway, all of that being said, yes, I, I would love to see a rise um, leading off for the Twins. But I also think that it's fair to point out that if you're going to get what you consider to be a top-line starter it's going to come at a substantial price. And as far as I know, Lopez is healthy, hasn't gotten hurt yet, arm not about to fall off. I'm with you, Phil, in the fact that I do think he's going to right himself. So I'm not going to rip the Twins because this is the price of going to get what they consider to be a frontline starter. Yeah, it's the price of poker to get starting pitching in the MLB right now. Um, And to be honest, there's still underlying metrics that would suggest Lopez is actually still having a pretty solid year. He's fighting through these last four or five starts that have been bad. No doubt. Those starts have been bad. There's no way to explain that. Um, But his FIP is actually still pretty lower than his ERA. He's striking out a lot of batters. Yeah, keeping the ball in the ballpark is probably going to be his his biggest thing. Uh, But I would rather take the front end starting rotation that has playoff caliber like rotation over a really really good leadoff hitter and don't get me wrong Lisa Rise is probably going to win a batting title and is really a damn good hitter I'd rather have the pitching over the really good leadoff hitter yeah I think even though this team is not it's it, this is not like a 100 win team you know the, even if they get hot they're going to be racing to get to 90 wins in, in a bad division but Give me these three starting pitchers and Pablo Lopez getting right at some point in a playoff series. So I I definitely see the vision. I understand the logic, too, that, okay, Arise, he doesn't hit for power. He's not the fastest. He's not going to steal bases, even though they've opened up the base stealing rules. And I think he has like one stolen base or something and one home run. 
He is a a very high end singles hitter who gets on base. Not the greatest fielder either. He's kind of positionless in that way. He's not a total train wreck, but he's not a wizard. He's not like an Ozzy Smith or something, you know, with the glove. Right. So I get their logic, which is he might have peaked last season, and this might be a good chance to sell high on him. But obviously, he didn't peak last season. He's his batting average is eighty points higher than it was last year. So there. And that's to me, that's one of the biggest criticisms of the Twins front office is that it doesn't always feel like they know how to project their own guys, right? Like oh, yeah. speaking of the Twins defender gatekeeper types, right? Like Yenier Cano goes to the Orioles and he is the best reliever in baseball this year. He's the guy they traded for Jorge Lopez, who's been one of the worst relievers in baseball the last three weeks or so. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the... And you got to be a pretty passionate Twins fan to even like care about Yenny or Cano or have followed that because and he had a nine ERA last year. But idiots like us on microphones and fans, like yeah, we see a guy with a nine ERA and say, "Ah, oh, if you can trade that guy, he's twenty nine years old for Jorge Lopez." Yeah, that's a great deal. But if you're a front office of a major league baseball team, I'd love to know how shocked are they that this dude with like a couple tweaks from the Orioles has become this lights-out relief pitcher. Were they not able to project that? Were they well, not able to to tweak him in the way that he needed to be? What went wrong there? That's why I think it's absolutely imperative to go on a fact-finding mission because the second point that you said, Phil, to me is the most important. Did they find something that we didn't? Like, did, did he just find Lamont, himself? Lamont Wade's another one, by the way. Like, right. you're, looking for, you're looking for good outfielders who can get on base and stuff. But like this he is what to... I want to know, right? Like, did they find something that the Twins didn't? Because that's the one thing. Like, the Twins can't afford not to, not to, to just say, oh, got away in, you know, in Baltimore. They fixed him. Um, I do think the Mally trade is going to be the one that's going to come back and bite you in the ass bad. I think that's the trade that's going to bite you. Like the Ar- the Arise trade is top of mind because it's two big names, but the Reds trade I think is going to hurt you. Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I, I agree. I think Lopez is going to be. You're going to like Lopez at the end of the year. I think. I yeah. think, but we'll see. Uh, before we get to the fourth and fifth categories here, let's shout out our friends over at Livia helping Score North, Purple Daily, and Mackie and Judd listeners lose a lot of weight over the past couple of years, Judd. Indeed, and the, the key here is they're not only going to help you drop the weight. I dropped uh, 40 pounds now a couple of years ago, but they are their dietitians and nutritionists are going to help you keep that weight off, and that's the most important thing. So it's not just getting down. It's also staying there because I think for a lot of us, that's the toughest thing. We've all lost weight. The question is, can you sustain it? The answer is absolutely, and a new offer as of today, if you join now, eight weeks for free. That's right. Lose up to 15 pounds by the 4th of July or heck more eight weeks for free. So imagine that you're in July, you're out on the boat, you're feeling good, looking good. And you got eight weeks for free. 855 go L I V E A Livia.com Livia L I V E A.com. That is where your weight loss and sustained weight loss starts. And now that you, you look a little better, Maybe you maybe it's time to take that shirt off and shop at Power Lodge or Miller Marine. Get on that Bennington pontoon, have some fun on the water. By the way, uh, Power Lodge locations in Brainerd, Onamia, and Ramsey, and Miller Marine in St. Cloud, and uh, prices are 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 very very friendly right now for these Bennington pontoons. So I recommend getting out some throttle therapy, Judd Zolgad, this summer. Look at that, just right, right there on the water a gorgeous day in fact you know what is there a a, or would there be a better time to be on your bennington than than right now because you know it's been humid it's been hot but it's actually gorgeous outside and imagine being out there on your bennington cooled off feeling great as phil just said throttle therapy starts on that bennington and and sports dad can tell you right now that if you follow sports in this town throttle therapy is imperative to your mental health PowerLodge.com, MillerMarine.com. I did ask our friends at Power Lodge, hey, could we do a podcast from a pontoon at some point this summer? And they're checking on how we can make that happen logistically. But I love this. I don't know how we would do it necessarily for YouTube. We'd have to kind of figure that out. But uh, we'll take some video of it. But they, I think they said yes. Okay. So we'll get Judd out on a pontoon, dishing some some Twins takes or some Vikings takes at some takes point. Takes on the water. 
Wow. Takes yeah. on the water. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, category number four here, State of the Twins. <laughs> Have the Twins gone a little too far letting pitchers pitch into the seventh? Okay, this was a huge criticism last year because the Twins allowed their starting pitchers the fewest amount of times facing a lineup the third time last year. This year, they've they've been uh, elevated to eighth, the eighth most amount of times facing hitters a third time. But a couple times this weekend, twin starting pitchers, Joe Ryan, give up a run or two in the seventh inning and let him pitch through it. So have we have we gone a little too far here trusting starting pitchers? Where are you at with this? Um, speaking firsthand from watching the games on Saturday with Sonny Gray pitching and then, of course, on Sunday with uh, Joe Ryan pitching. And both of them gave up uh, runs. I wanted to talk about this because I will tell you right now, absolutely not. I think what the Twins are doing right now is 100% the right thing. Now, it was putrid and made me nauseous to watch them at the plate, okay? So, and, and that's on that's on the hitters. But I actually think that if you are going to, well, in this case, it's not puking up a lead, but a tie game, something like that. If you are going to give up a home run or you are going to give up a run in the seventh and your starter is pitching well, I would far prefer to see that guy allowed to stay, stay in. And, you know, there's a very good case to be made that in both of the starts by Gray on Saturday and Ryan on Sunday, they deserved, the Twins did, to win those games. And those pitchers pitched yeah. well, well enough that they deserve to pitch deep into the games and stay there. So I actually will say that I think what the Twins are doing now is, is far preferable. Now, if you had a Duran who could come in in the seventh and blow guys away, it's probably different. But this bullpen at that, at you know, I guess what's technically the front end is not that great. It's okay at times, but it's certainly, it's certainly not lights out. I like the fact that the Twins are allowing guys to stay in. And if it's not like it was six runs against, right? So in both cases, in the case of Gray and Ryan, I applaud what they did there, even though both of them gave up runs. And by the way, statistically, so again, last year, the Twins, in addition to not trusting or letting pitchers pitch into the seventh inning, they also had the worst, or I think it was like the second worst OPS against. They were awful. They And, they, and so they didn't really earn the trust to go a third time through the order. And I would argue, too, Maybe there are some things in the scouting reports or just in the way that could the Twins have done a better job organizationally helping guys navigate a third time through the line, right? Well, this year, Twins starting pitchers have the fourth best OPS against allowed third time through the order. So they're earning the trust. They're performing pretty well third time through. This weekend is the exception. So I, I don't know. I tend to agree with, with Judd. Don't let a couple blips all of a sudden scare you back into pulling st good starting pitchers after you know the fifth inning. Yeah, and, and look, outside of Duran right now, who was awesome uh, on Friday night, uh, you don't really have enough horses in your bullpen to really trust it. So let your starters, who have been basically the best rotation in baseball, let them hang. Let them go out there. Let them, let them be out on the bump for the seventh inning and then be the you know match it up appropriately when you have to bring in Duran or if you want to go add another reliever. Brock Stewart's been fine, but mostly a lot of these bullpen, it's still you know inconsistent. So if it's an inconsistent bullpen, I'd rather give the benefit of the doubt to a really good starting rotation. By the way, uh, the Twins were maybe right about Griffin Jacks. He's been pretty good his last, like, seven outings, I want to say. And he's an example of, okay, there's going to be rocky stretches, but if you do trust some of the analytical framework, a guy's strikeout rate versus walk rate, FIP is one that we bring up on this show, which is essentially your expected ERA. If your ERA is high, but everything else is in line, Generally, it means you're going to work your way through it. And it looks like Griffin Jacks might be doing that. I know Jeb wanted to punt him to Abu Dhabi about two weeks ago on the show. Uh, so the Twins' problem is this. When it comes to their bullpen especially, they get guys on the, the right track, and then they change their roles because they, they assume that being on the right track in one situation will translate. And then that player can start to have problems again. And then they start the whole thing again. So this, when it comes to the actual assessment of some areas, they're, they're good. When it comes to some common sense things, they do some stupid things. 
I think Griffin Jacks belongs in your trust tree of of three relievers right now. I think if you if you so I mean Duran's in a different category, but like if I, you oh, give God. me two other guys, Griffin Jacks is in that category for me. Not that you're choosing between like you know the right. early '90s Reds bullpen or right. the you know late is '90s Yankees. Bibble, bullpen. Yeah. is it Charlton? Randy yeah. Myers, maybe? No, you're right. By the way, so his expected ERA, which that's it's FIP, fielding independent pitching number is 2.14, which is two runs lower than his actual ERA. Last year, at the end of the year, his real ERA was 3.36. His expected ERA was 3.17. It was basically identical. I trust the framework here, and I'm going to keep putting him in some high-leverage situations. You need to get Lopez fixed. That's all I'll say. You need to get him fixed. You cannot. He is unpitchable right now. He's lost the strike zone completely. Yeah. Um. He is a mental mess. And this is not one where I'm, you know, I'm done here now. No. You acquired this guy for a guy who is through, you know, to the Orioles credit or what, doing great. You need to get him fixed. This is not an option of, well, it didn't work out. Yeah, well, sometimes there's, you know, he's had a checkered past in terms of know, productivity. So it's, it's not saying. like he has an eight-year track record of being a lights-out reliever. Last year was kind of like, oh, he put it all together. So is it is it a how did they trade for a house of cards is what yep. I think they, I would be wondering here. And if they did, I'd be very concerned about that again. I guess at least the guy they gave up, even though he is the best reliever in baseball, isn't like 23. At least he's 29 or 30 and could also, you know, at – in two Ball years play. from now, just be a complete bust. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Fix it. All right, category number five, the final category here. We're going to throw it to Judd for an update on the Bally's situation. Coming Reporter up next. Judd. Coming up next on Bally Sports North. We have, uh, we, we're good. You know what? Jorge Lopez has done a lot of good in the community. <laughs> so much good. We're going to talk about that. We're going to follow him to children's hospitals. Anyway, okay. So the Bally's thing um, it is, has been discussed a ton and talked about. Um, but I, one thing I've not seen is, like, if the, ba- if the Twins leave Bally's during the course of the summer, when could that be exactly? Because I've been – I think that's the, the most important thing. Like, what's the drop-dead time? And where um, can you find them? And Yeah. Exactly. So the next payment – that Bally's now has to make in full. So it can't just say, here's here's 25%. They have to make this, because the judge said this in full, is due on July 1st. There's language in the contract, though, that creates a grace period. So like if the Twins don't have the check by 5 p.m. July 1st, the games are not going off Bally's at that point. The grace period takes us to around the All-Star break. So if they're going to leave Bally's and go and, and basically launch a streaming platform, which is what they would do, those games would hit the streaming platform, which I think, if the Padres are the perfect example, would be free. Uh, would be free for about a week, and then I think there'd be a charge of approximately like seventy dollars per streaming platform, you know, to to subscribe. But those games would probably leave Bally Sports North post All Star break. So would they? When when you say like the July first payment date, because they haven't paid the last two months, right? Bally's. They've um, been they ordered part, to pay. Yeah, and they paid part of. They actually did go back and pay part of the start of this the season payment, uh, but it's not been paid in full. But they are now obligated to pay that in full and also everything in July first. Yes, oh, okay, it's all in full now. Interesting. And so, it's it, there's a million places you could obviously park for streaming, but for for fans who don't have, um, let me rephrase it because everyone has access to streams, but for fans who don't really participate in streaming content gonna, like gonna older baseball to, fans you're, you're gonna have to start so it won't be available on a channel it won't my, be available anywhere on cable or or regular tv my understanding is you would have to have and this is not like a big stretch a smart tv to get the app to stream it off of that's a problem for a lot of baseball fans it is it is but here is where and i didn't know know this until i did some digging here is where this is going and this is why baseball is excited because i've been like is baseball really excited because teams are going to you know as bally's defaults lose payments and i i've also was told this this is not 
really bally's it's the creditors so the creditors own the network basically yeah. so this is not like sports people like we can't pay you sorry this, this is like a hedge fund with bleep you we're not paying right mm-hmm. so anyway but i've been like why are they excited about this i don't get that and here's why every team owns its television property rights so like if i'm the cubs i start mar- marquee yankees started yes dodgers have their sports net thing and they control those rights, and then they keep everything from them w- with a small bit of a revenue share that exists right now mm-hmm. that they ha- have to contribute back. But that's just a general pie. Okay. I didn't know this. Baseball owns streaming rights to every team. Now, they are allowing the teams who operate those rights right now, but they can pull them back at a moment's notice, meaning this, for the long term now. And this is going – I mean – I don't know if it's five years, three years, 10 years, but this is going in this direction, meaning that baseball can tell the Yankees, Red Sox, Dodgers, Cubs, pick your big team, big revenue team, and they can tell them, hey, we are going to share the pie on TV completely. And those teams can be like, that's garbage. We're the Red Sox. We keep all of ours. And because baseball on streaming, baseball can then say, okay, we are going to take your streaming rights over and they can basically then share those streaming rights revenues. So you're saying, could it be like an MLS situation with the streaming? Yes. So locally, well, locally, you can have your own local TV deal over the air or cable. But for but for streaming, that right. goes into a different bin. But, but in you know, as we go forward, yet the answer to your question is yes. But as we progress, streaming is going to become where it's at. Mm-hmm. And and all of these cable networks, not just Bally's, are suffering from cord cutters and financially. Yeah. So eventually they're going to go away. Like they're not going to look like this. Correct. So streaming is going to become king. So this and is actually does, expediting a process that needs to happen anyways. And when it does, baseball, baseball will try to copy the National Football League by saying, we are going to share the pie from your games being shown with everybody. Super interesting because that's going to piss off the big market. There's a oh. there's this is a whole conversation to unpack. But if you're the twins, it's great news yeah. long term because if you can get Boy. if you can tap in now, now you're being now your checks are starting to come. And the last thing is nationally, so like the Foxes, they actually want want more games because live sports oh, yeah. are the last bastion of advertising dollars. Yeah, it's it's still live sports is still built in eyeballs more than even if even baseball like it's still guaranteed eyeballs. Yep. And it's relatively inexpensive outside of the gigantic rights fees that you wind up paying. So, so anyhow, there's your there's your update. I don't think I don't think that you'll see the Twins again for instance on Channel 9 or 45 something like that. But I do think that what you'll see is more and more games, like Twins games, that will be regionalized on Fox National. There he is. Capital J, Judd Zolgad, journalist, bringing the, the inside TV. scoop there. Beat, baby. On your State of the Twins Monday here, presented by Modest Brewing. Stop by, steps away from Target Field and the Light Rail. Minnesota Sports with Mackie and Judd. We'll see you guys tomorrow.